So we're going to start off tonight's case. It is January of 1964, and a young girl named Catalina Ortega escapes a brothel in Jalisco, Mexico, and goes straight to the police station. There, she makes a shocking accusation, one that would lead to the capture of one of the most brutal group of serial killers in Mexican history. Hello, I am The Grin, and joining me tonight is the lovely... Amari. And tonight we have a very, very special guest, my friend Wilder. Um, Will you introduce yourself, please? Thank you for saying my name right. You're welcome. Hello, my name is Wilder. (laughs) He's not very into dark topics, but we dragged him in for this one. Mainly for his reactions. You guys can't see it, but we get to. Yes. It's a special little gift. We'll let you know his facial expressions when they change. But welcome to our podcast, a place where we do not shy away from the gruesome details where some things may be triggering and hard to hear. Listener discretion is advice. So get yourself in the right space of mind and let's talk about dark shit. So tonight we're talking about the Gonzale Valenzuela sisters and they were born in Salto, Jalisco. The four sisters from eldest to youngest were Maria Delfina, born in 1912, Maria del Carmen, born in 1918, Maria Luisa, born in 1920, and Maria de Jesus, born in 1924. Okay, so we're going by their middle names. We're definitely <laughs> going to go by the middle names because we need to know who is who. That's going to play an important thing into this. We're going to call them Mary J. <laughs> Mary, <laughs> Mary 1, Mary 2. <laughs> Start referring them by their birth year. So some sources state that Maria Luisa was the youngest, with Maria de Jesus being older than her. Other sources say they were born in 1910, Delfina, 1921, Luisa, and 1922, Maria de Jesus. But I'm going to go with the main article that I read for this case, which states the order that I presented them in the beginning. The father, Isidro, was a shopkeeper who would later in life become chief of police, and their mother, Bernardina, was an extremely religious woman and drilled Catholicism into her daughters. Both parents were abusive in their own way. Isidro was an alcoholic and a sexist man who had strict rules for his daughters and who would beat them. When any of his daughters disobeyed any of his rules, he would lock them up in a cell at the local jail. Carmen would be the first to try and leave her family. She got together with an older man and tried to run away with him. I think mainly to just run away from the abuse. When Isidro found out about the plan, he looked for his daughter, found her, beat her, and then incarcerated her for indecent behavior. This makes me feel so weird inside. Like this whole time, I just feel uneasy. Yeah, it's they experience a lot of abuse. That power, like the power trip and everything. And it's it's so strange because I was reading their past, and it's one of those cases where. You feel bad for them at the time when they were girls, but you you cannot feel bad for them for what they're about to do. Mm-hmm. Feeling still at rage, he would go on to shoot a random man, killing him, and then having to go on the run. Carmen would be in prison for 14 months until she was finally released because nobody thought to go and release her. For running away with your boyfriend. For indecent behavior. She was charged. She was actually charged for that. She Wait, what? he charged her for indecent behavior? Her for, father charged her for indecent behavior. Even though she behavior. didn't do anything indecent, just in his eyes, though, as the father. Exactly. Yep. Mm-hmm. Father of the year. Carmen would then marry a 50-year-old grocer who leaves her when he finds out she is pregnant. Now, during this time, she was working as a sex worker, so maybe that was the reason why he also left her. It's kind of unclear whether he left her because she was pregnant or because she was a sex worker. And at that age, she was what, in her 20s? Young 20s? 30s. Oh, she was She was in her 30s? Yeah. Working older. as a sex worker. And he was 50? Yeah. Hmm. Pretty older man. Okay. She then met and got together with Jesus El Gato Vargas. <laughs> they opened up an unsuccessful bar together because Jesus would spend all the pro- uh, profits on alcohol. When her sister Delfina found out about her sister's bar, she had an idea. She would open up a bar, quotation marks, but in actuality, she would open up a brothel. Delfina would go on to open her brothel in El Salto, Jalisco, and disguised her business as a regular cantina, which is bar in Spanish. What's a brothel? A brothel is basically a strip club. Oh, my young friend. Yeah. Since brothels were illegal 
in most parts in Mexico. So for that reason, she disguised it as just a local bar. Aren't brothels illegal now anyways? Now they are. At the time, no, depending on the state. Really? Yes. I did not know that. You know what? Honestly, I always thought brothels was an out-of-the-country thing, like Germany or Well, this Australia. is Mexico. That's another country. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but since El Salto was farther from the big city, there were less regulations in place to stop things like this. The girl she had working at her brothel ranged in age from 12 to 15, and she got these girls by either kidnapping them from local villages or offering them or their families jobs as housekeepers or factories, then forcing them into sex slavery. Many of her customers were police officers, military officers, politicians. However, in 1948, stricter laws were in place and she she was forced to close her bar and move her business to San Juan de los Lagos, Jalisco. And she changed the name of her bar, again in quotation marks, to El Guadalajara de la Noche. This is when her other sisters decided to help her out with the business because they saw how successful it was. They would be in charge of the kitchen and collecting cash. Carmen decided to sell her makeup, clothes, and other personal needs to the girls. She would do this by selling everything at high prices and then making the girls basically indebted to them. Okay, so then change the name from being a bar to what did you call it? Guadalajara. Well, that's the it, Guadalajara well, she, it, at it, night. Uh huh. Basically, El Guadalajara de la Noche of the night. Yes, because it and was just called. Brothel mm. is about women of the night. Yeah. No, nope, nobody caught on again. With the name alone. Customers included politicians, okay, police officers, okay, yeah. military officers. So, um, everybody just turned a blind eye. Yeah. Is all I'm going to say. Just two weeks in business at this new location, Delfina had enough money to move her business again, but this time to San Francisco del Rincón, Guanajuato, a place where brothels were actually legal. Here, they bought a brothel that belonged to a man whose nickname was El Pocuyachi, which then would later on become their infamous nickname. All four sisters, El Pocuyachi. What does that mean? Honestly, I looked it up. I don't know what it means. Pocuanchi? Pocuanchi. Pocuanchi? I think it's a type of bird. Pocuanchi. It's like a Western thing, right? Yeah, but that was the man's nickname. And when they bought his when they bought his property, the nickname fell on to the sisters. Okay. Her business would become very successful at this new location, so much so that her sister, Maria de Jesus, took two of the girls and decided to open up her own brothel in León, Guanajuato. She had the same type of clients at her sister's, but at this location, the local priest was another client. Oh, this, oh, this is nauseating. It's horrible. Yeah. It's pretty sickening. But those were the type of people that they had as clients. See, I was going to say, do they even have like low lives actually being clients? But these people were there doing that's low life. Yeah. But do they even have like the low class workers being like, what are they called? Customers? Like low class people? Yeah. Not I would assume so. Titles like priest and chief and. I would assume like so. But I think they targeted these upper class people because I mean. The higher in class, the more money, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is what they were after. They realized that they needed more girls, so they ended up kidnapping and tricking girls all over Jalisco, Guanajuato, Michoacán, and Zacatecas. Once the girls arrived at the brothels, they were raped, showered in freezing water, drugged, and forced to work on their first night. Once the girls reached the age of 25, they and or were deemed damaged by repeated rape or stopped pleasing their customers, or were basically looked as ugly, in quotation marks, they were sent to El Verdugo. Do you guys know what that is? Verdugo? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've heard of it now. It's Spanish for an executioner. Uh, yes. What? Yeah. They if were... you're ugly, you need to die? Yep. 
Because I'm not getting enough money for you. There's no purpose. There's Why no don't purpose you just for let you. Them go and let them get married. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Be free, young one. These go. women. This is what I was saying. There's, there's no. I don't feel bad for these women no. for what they're doing now. What is it if they were free? They could potentially expose what was happening. But to who? These are all these corrupt. Are, yeah. Corrupt people. Who are they in to power? Tell? Yeah. This is a horrible case of abuse of power. The Verdugo would then either starve or beat the girls to death, is how they would end up killing them. They would also kill customers who had large sums amount of money on them. Oh, to rob them? Exactly. Mm. Now, the sisters also had a list of rules for the girls, which included no kissing, no sexual acts between the girls, no anal or oral sex, if any clients requested any of these acts to be performed, they were banned from the brothels. And to make sure nobody broke any of these rules, the sisters actually drilled little peepholes in the rooms to keep surveillance. It was also against the rules to get pregnant or get sick. If any of the girls broke any of these rules, they were punished and punished severely. So they can't get sick? They cannot get sick. Like a cold? Flu? They had to be or healthy like enough to work, disease. basically. And as long as you could still work, I think. Pretty sure they still put them to work. but The, the word transmitted is in there. It'll yeah. transfer. <laughs> you can't work if it transfers to somebody else. <laughs> so basically, They didn't care about the health of anybody. They just wanted money. So basically what? They would put them to work unless they physically couldn't get Yeah, up. exactly. And then if that was the case, then what? They just They would send them, them off to the executioner and die. <laughs> it's like cattle. Yeah. Literally. They're cows. Yeah. Or... Or they wouldn't even execute them if they were deemed still beautiful sometimes. They would just punish them. Now, some of their forms of punishment, having the girls kneel down and then with bricks on their hands and then have having other girls beat them with a bat that had nails attached to it. Oh other punishments included starvation or having the girls beat them with uh, bat rods and sticks. Delfina had a son nicknamed El Tepocate, who also helped with the torture and rape and would control the girls. In 1963, brothels became illegal in Guanajuato, so the sisters moved their business back to Lagos de Moreno, Jalisco. There, Delfina's son got into a bar fight at a local bar and was killed. Enraged, Delfina attempted to shoot her son's killer but missed. When officials found out about this, they tried to arrest Delfina, but she went into hiding in Guadalajara. They raided Maria de Jesus's brothel and Maria, and the girls were forced to get locked up for the entire day because they wouldn't allow the policemen to actually go in. Mm. So they just locked themselves in. Okay. Then at night, when nobody was out, I guess surveillance wasn't a thing, they ended up escaping San Francisco del Rincón, where the sisters owned a house. And these girls were forced to stay there for eight months, where many of them died from starvation and sickness. On January 6, 1964, the sisters moved the girls to Rancho San Angel after feeling cornered by the police. This location was used as a dumping ground. They would torture and bury their victims here. Twelve days later, Catalina Ortega, the girl who I mentioned in the intro, escaped and went straight to the police. The police there that took her declaration was actually one of the clients oh, of no. the sisters. However, he decided to actually look into it because he didn't know about the murders. He just was aware about the rapes. He was like, God, my favorite girl was murdered. <laughs> what the hell? That's <laughs> sick. <laughs> oh, that's, that's uh, I, I don't know. Done with them. Yeah. When the police raided Rancho San Angel, the sisters denied all charges, but they would go on to discover over 90 bodies buried there. When they were arrested, the police had to move them to a prison in Guanajuato due to threats of lynching. Only three of the sisters were arrested. The youngest, Maria Luisa, left the business after 10 years. Well, yeah, she's, was she the one that was just slaying the makeup? Yeah. <laughs> but when she heard of her sister's arrest, she traveled to Guanajuato to see them. When she arrived, she was arrested on charges of Satanism and brujería. What? Yeah. When did... It didn't... I don't remember you saying anything of her doing that earlier. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't mention anything about that. 
I think they just wanted all sisters. She was just be. selling makeup. <laughs> Where's the Satanism? In Honestly, it? this woman was aware of what's going on, and she didn't stop her sisters. So, do I feel she bad for her? Accomplice. No. And the yes, name of exactly. the red lipstick was called Lucifer. <laughs> <laughs> that was the Satanism. <laughs> that Lucifer look. <laughs> <laughs> that dark gothic look. <laughs> When police interrogated the sisters about the deaths, one sister said the food didn't sit well with them. That's why they would die. They were tried that same year in 1964 and were each given a sentence of 40 years in prison. While in prison, a construction worker tried to get a glimpse of Delfina and accidentally dropped a bucket of cement on her head. And I say accidentally in quotation marks. These women were hated, killing her in the process. Maria Carmen died in prison due to cancer. Maria Luisa and Maria de Jesus were both released from, pis- from prison. Maria de Jesus went into hiding and nothing is known of her after her release. And Maria Luisa went mad, fearing people were after her and would go on to die at a mental hospital. Oh. El Capitan, who was Delfina's boyfriend, was also tried for his involvement in the torturing and killing of the girls. At age 76, when he was told he would be released from prison, he died of a heart attack after receiving the news. No politician, no police officer, no military military officer was ever tried. Of course. Now, it is believed that the four sisters killed more than 200 people and got a spot in the Guinness World Record for most prolific murder partnership. Damn. But was later taken out of the book because of... The whole fact that you're giving a spot to serial killers and maybe encouraging other people. Hey, I want to break that record. <laughs> That's okay, true. People I can kill before getting caught. Yeah. That's true. Um, when I was looking up this case, I was aware of this case for a long time. But when I was looking it up, there was a documentary that I read across about. The documentary is called Anita. And it's about this elderly woman. Uh, well, now she's elderly, but she was actually one of the victims of the sisters. And she reflects on the torture that she endured and the many nights of fear that she had. And it's it's so disheartening because she sometimes, she still has nightmares and she still hasn't fully recovered from the trauma. And keep in mind, she is like, like elderly, like in her seventies, and, and she probably grabbed her when she was like what? 12, she was 12 she was a young little girl, yeah. And um, she would tell her kids, and it. She goes on to explain it's like not the same. You you can explain to somebody what you went through, but they'll never fully know what you did go through. And it, it just broke me when she started crying during the documentary i couldn't find the whole thing but i was able to watch just clips of it that i found on the internet that's so sad that was one of the many cases there was another case actually of two sisters who went to the brothel to work they were lied to they were promised jobs as housekeepers and again on their first night arriving there they were forced to work and basically raped on their first night. The younger sister dying, the older sister going to prison. Um, something that I forgot to mention here is that some of the girls were tried for murder because these women... Oh, because they forced them to do it. These women would force their some of the girls to basically murder each other. And that was actually one of their arguments was, how could you try me for murder if... I never actually touched them. I never actually killed them, which is... Charles Manson. <laughs> right? Yes. Yeah. Which, I mean, think about it. Yeah, like, they would send them off to an executioner, have somebody else do it, or just have the other girls just beat them or just not give food to them, hold back food and water. So they that don't want to could... get their hands dirty. Exactly. But yes, that was one of the many stories that you could find on YouTube. I tried looking up to see if there was other people who... I swear, I thought you were going to say Mujeres Asesinas. <laughs> Actually, there is, an episode, really? there is an episode of them in that show um, depicting just like a glimpse of some of the brutality that these sisters inflicted on their victims. But yes, I would definitely try to see if anybody knows how I can watch the full documentary of Anita, let me know. Spanish 
and Mexican viewers, listeners. Oh, there's actually also a movie that depicted this um, horrific crime. And it's also named Las Pocuachis. And that one, that one did kind of a good job in showing what it was like after the investigation, like after they discovered the sisters. And then they would interview some of the girls. I never got to find out if the interviews that they did with the actresses was actually like stuff that they got from real life victims. Um, but you could see how they kind of like made the women so like malnourished. It's kind of like you watching um, you watching movies set in the Holocaust. You know how they were like so malnourished, so like basically like it was like, dead like in a, the face. Like age, oh, I forgot the name of the movie, but with Adrian Brody. Yes, yes. You see how he's like almost like emaciated. And it, yes, he just lost. Basically, a part of him. It's like hard to even. You can see the pain in him. You can see like the shock. Yeah, that's. Uh, But whenever they do that, I'm like, these are really good actors. But it kind of gives you an idea of what people went through. But that is my case for tonight. They are considered one of the most brutal, if not the most brutal, serial killers in Mexican history, and the fact that they're women. I don't know. Kind of interesting. You would think it's a man, but not that that says anything about girl power. In fact, no, no. I, you know, I actually, girl power. I forgot who it is. There's one YouTuber I listen to, but I think she says that she's interested in the women murderers because they're more methodical. Mm-hmm. I am very, same here. I'm very, very interested in the females over the males. Most of the time, honestly, when I'm reading these cases and researching stuff and trying to come up things to say on the podcast or in general, because I am into true crime, the women sometimes tend to be more, what's the good word? Like bitches. Yes. But <laughs> they tend to be a bit more brutal. Yeah. Yeah. But they're smart about it. Yeah. They think about what they're going to do. Yeah. They don't want to get dirty. Yeah. And I think that's how I got into true crime. Well, this is back to the intro, how I got into true crime. Because I always saw women as nurturers growing up. And because I had a lot of really good women surrounding me. So when I discovered that there are some twisted women out there who, mm-hmm. you know, do not give a, a fuck about anything, um, it kind of like shocks you a little bit. They're strong, independent women. They don't need no help. The fact that one even of these women, actually, the something that I haven't even mentioned and, you know, something that you would think that would touch her heart a little bit is that one of these women, one of these sisters was actually a mother. She didn't care. She, she didn't raised care. her son to be the same. A sadistic, horrible rapist. I don't know if you guys can hear it, but there is a train. Um, it's, what is it called? It's honking. So just yes. you guys know in case you hear that in the background. Apologies about that. But yeah, it's it's so interesting the way the mind works that way. But yes, that is tonight's case of Las Pocuyachis. And as always, remember to be well, be safe, and see you next time.